I know it's an easy thing to claim, but there are times where I am racked with bouts of introspection, where I look upon the state of things and wonder, is it really the world or is it me? Are the standards I place upon games unfair? Are the standards I place upon content creators unfair? Are the standards I place upon people unfair? And just as I'm about to reach the final moment where I accept that I am the problem, something comes along to really validate that no, my standards aren't unfair, things really are that bad. Not to start with a black pill mind, I just love Elden Ring. It's a great game, no counterpoint, no catering to sensibilities before I slip the knife in about how it's actually really bad, and you just don't know it yet, but don't worry because I'm going to tell you. I can handily recommend this game. Even if you aren't a typical FromSoft fan and find Dark Souls hard, it seems like it is a pretty easy game to pick up, and as long as you have an open mind when the game starts to get difficult, you should be able to adapt to it, and maybe even use Elden Ring as a gateway to other games. It is a tough act to follow having a previous game of yours voted as Game of the Decade, an assessment that I actually agree with. A broken PC port that was fixed by fans and shipped with intrusive DRM and had unfinished areas at the end of the game is definitely a good pick for the 2010s as Game of the Decade. I can't imagine anything more succinctly describing the time period. But if we're using the award as an actual assessment of quality, then I personally think Dark Souls 1 is undeserving. It's a fine game, but it has too many issues for such an accolade. Of course, it's been over a decade and From Software has come a long way as a studio. We finally have a dedicated jump button, for one. I have three main issues with Elden Ring. One of them is a teething issue, one is a tuning issue, and one is just a regular issue. All things considered, I find these criticisms to be exceptionally minor to the overall experience. I can easily imagine this game being on the patrician tier in a few years. With that said, how well does Elden Ring handle the transition to the open world format? In my opinion, not that well. From's format is generally built around more linear structures. You will have branches, and the longer you play, the more of the world opens up, but it's obvious that their games have traditionally been built around a guided experience. For instance, in Dark Souls 1, after you escape the Undead Asylum, you are technically given multiple options. However, Undeadburg is the most visible from the shrine, and a quick probe into the difficulty of each option suggests that it is also the easiest, especially if you are new to the game. That doesn't stop people from going into the catacombs or ringing the bell of awakening below Blighttown first, I am generally operating under the principle of what a first-time player is likely to do. In Elden Ring, once you reach the first step, you are basically cut loose into this world. There are a lot of areas you can't reach yet, and there are some areas that have the same guidance using mob difficulty, but even just exploring Limgrave is a much more open experience than your traditional FromSoft game. Now, I want to head off the little caveat devil that is going to counter literally everything I say with examples of how you can do exactly the opposite. Like, yeah, speedrunners are really taking advantage of From's inexperience with open worlds when it comes to their routes. Speedrunners are not average players. I'm sure new players are going to know to go to Gale Tunnel and Kaled to get the Katana Moonveil. What? It's intuitive. What about this vista doesn't suggest that's exactly the way you should go? It's an old problem with the Dark Souls commentary. Which is that just because a solution technically exists, doesn't make the original criticism invalid. Dragons in Skyrim constantly flying away are still annoying, even after you get the Dragonrend shout, which technically solves that problem. My first real issue with the open world is one of progression. In essence, it's the same old FromSoft formula without accounting for the change in world design. The problem I had was that my first character, a sorcerer, didn't find anything for her playstyle after six hours, so I rerolled to a faith build where I immediately started having fun because of all the faith stuff I was finding. I have been told the opposite account as well, that someone rolled faith and couldn't find anything for it but found tons of sorcery stuff. I don't necessarily believe that. On account of the fact that my six hours involved a lot of time in the first dungeon area at Stormvale Castle. Ah, but my mistake was not buying a cryptic note that says that someone's hiding out at Waypoint Ruins. Yes, let's just uh, step out and try to find that from the Church of Allah. Inshallah, brothers. Well, I see a lot of ruins. Now, these are the Waypoint Ruins, which I missed on my sorcerer because even after six hours I'd yet to make it out this way. Even on my second character the first time I passed it just because I'd gotten distracted by another thing I wanted to investigate. I think it was one of those carts that's getting pulled by the giant with the, ch with the uh, chest attached to it. And I forgot to check out the ruins with the giant flower. 
Now, I want to say that I don't think the idea here is actually a bad thing. It means that there are a lot of different ways people will have experienced the game. It's pretty normal in a FromSoft game to have to find a teacher for sorceries, miracles, and pyromancies, and they might even be a ways away from the start. But because the games are linear, and you can easily be thorough in exploring levels, you will find the occasional bone the game throws for your playstyle, unless it's Faith. But when the game is open world, then the designers have no way of knowing whether or not their players reached a specific spot or found a specific item. To give a comparison, Griggs of Venheim is the early game sorcery teacher in DS1. He's hidden in Lower Undeadburg behind a door that you will need to buy a key for from a merchant. The difference is that you can find everything in Lower Undeadburg in one or two passes, while you would need a checklist and a map on the second monitor to track everything down in Limgrave. You'll probably find most of it, but not all of it, unless you really enjoy lawn mowing open world maps. It just seems to me like everything key tied to core progression, like upgrading your weapons, spells, and equipment should be in the parts of the game you can be confident 99% of players will actually see, sort of like how the blacksmith now lives in the hub area instead of a random part of the map. The Waypoint Ruins should have a guy living in it that sells a unique set of armor, for example, not the first sorcery instructor. Or how about we switch around the order of the sorcery teacher and sorcerer Roger. Maybe Roger lives in the ruins while the sorcery teacher's living in Stormvale. See, this game causes me anxiety. Because I know that I am constantly just narrowly missing stuff. Hell, I narrowly missed the entire madness mechanic until the end of the game when I came back to an area and realized I was within feet of finding it the first time. I almost could have said that the game doesn't really introduce madness at all, even though it does, because in my playthrough I just happened to avoid those areas, again, often just barely. You can try to say I should go back to places and be more thorough, but the game world is full of distractions, and doesn't really have a good system of tracking where you have and have not been, and even then, how thorough you were. Like I've been to a lot of places, but did I actually get everything there? In this case, I would recommend the map working like it does in Metal Gear Survive. Do you deep cut, I know. It's actually just a more detailed map version of Morrowind. Basically, everywhere you go is shown on the map, making it very easy to keep track of areas you've already explored for unique items and what areas you still need to visit. They even give you a percentage to know how much of the map there is still to be discovered. Instead, they opted for a style closer to a Ubisoft game, where you just unlock a giant chunk of the map at these waypoints all at once. I still don't think I saw the waypoint marker until my second run. It's not like unlocking the map is a consistent reward for fighting bosses, most of them are just out on the side of the road. People give me a lot of shit for missing these ruins, but I want you to consider something. The main reason I re-rolled was this. I went to the hub area and within seconds of arrival encountered an incantation teacher just hanging out at the shrine. He was there for most of the game too. That was my problem. It seemed like every other playstyle had an upgrade path at the round table hold. It was only sorcery that actually had to go out and find their teacher. Which is why I rerolled to another character which I instantly started having more fun on. Does that make sorceries a bad class to start? Yes. Seriously, the first day of Elden Ring I saw a ton of people playing Astronomer, but when I re-rolled it seemed so did everyone else because suddenly there were just a lot less of them, as ghosts, messages, summons, or summoners. Does that make sorceries a bad playstyle in general? Well, no, but it is typical for a bad starting playstyle to eventually become decent in FromSoft games. My next issue has to do with weapon progression. There are two modes, Normal and Somber. The main difference is that somber weapons seem to all have fixed weapon arts, while normal weapons allow you to customize them. It's a great division of mechanics in my opinion, the problem is that the progressions are terrible. It is easier to level somber weapons in Elden Ring than normal weapons because you need less stones to upgrade somber weapons, and areas consistently provide more somber stones. For most of the game I could only spare the stones to level a single normal weapon, but was leveling multiple somber weapons at the same time. You might say that the idea is that I'm supposed to go collect upgrade resources from the marked maps, or that I can just buy the resources. To the latter, I would say, you unlock that ability much later on than when you start really needing it. I know the idea is to create resource scarcity until you find the bell bearing to unlock buying the smithing stones, which itself is extremely expensive compared to buying somber stones from the merchant, but as it stands, I had a single longsword barely managing to keep up with a golden halberd and a katana that shot energy.
And not for a lack of corners in the world to hide stuff. There's a chance well over 50% that if you decide to explore something, you will find a dead end. Or when you do find something, it's usually just material used for crafting. Now, there are ways to know the relative value of crafting materials, but that didn't stop the fact that I was being given materials that I think were supposed to be valuable and were supposed to excite me, but would disappoint me because I don't know off the top of my head what an, as an example, Arteria Leaf is. Oh, it's for Exalted Flesh, a consumable that boosts physical attack. Well, if the material needed to make it is so rare, then I better save it for when I really need it. It doesn't matter how true that actually is, the game made it seem rare by making it a reward. You can call that a skill issue. I personally would call it an undercooked crafting system. Bosses seemed more aggressive when I would use consumables, which was honestly just a cognitive bias. Like, I doubt the bosses were actually coded to be more aggressive when you use a limited resource. Although now that I think about it, it wouldn't really be that difficult to implement. The question is, does the game need a crafting system? I'm sure gimmick runs of beating the entire game using only consumables are super thankful for it. And there was the odd enemy I did cheese with poison darts or sleep pots, so I guess, yes. The crafting system is a mildly welcome addition. It still felt cheap to fight to the end of an area only for my reward to be a obscure crafting material, especially if it was a material that I hadn't unlocked a, an actual use for yet. I guess that's still better than fighting to the end of an area only for the reward to be a gesture, or nothing, as often seems to be the case. Now, again, I want to stress, I don't think these are outright bad things. My argument isn't that they failed and should never try these things again. They should absolutely try these things again, taking into consideration their faults with Elden Ring and improving. Something that will not happen if all from soft hears is that they've once again made the perfect video game. It is a shame that one of the few developers making curated experiences rather than outright open worlds took the Skyrim pill, but if FromSoft can adapt their format into open world, then they're already ahead by a mile of the rest of the market, especially given how many Souls clones there are. It's not like when Elder Scrolls abandoned a style of video game that nobody else ever really made. My next topic is a quick one, and that is multiplayer. This is one that could potentially be addressed in this game, since addressing the aforementioned open world problems would probably require, at minimum, a Scholar of the First Sin tier re-release, if not a complete overhaul. I just don't see them being able to fix the open world issues in a patch like they could with multiplayer. The issue with multiplayer is an absence. When I played DS3, I did every boss cooperatively, both as a summoner and as someone who was summoned. It was easy mode, but it was also fun that the community was progressing together, and the best time to play these games multiplayer is when they first launch. Since I had so many embers, I was just constantly buffed up and I got invaded a lot, and I had a lot of fun fighting off invaders. I also did a lot of invasion multiplayer at that game's launch for the covenants built around those ideas. My plans going in was to do the same here. The problem was again one of the open world. In essence, it felt like I was quickly losing track of everybody else. I either was leveling too much or too little, and there were bosses people weren't summoning for due to being pushovers. Bosses are also now made more difficult the more you summon, so it feels like there's a lack of incentive to really be a summoner. It's better to make use of the new spirit ashes instead, and it seems the community is following that track. Uh, apologies to anyone who opted into my summon role on my server, only for me to never use it because I ended up deciding to beat the entire game solo. In addition, invasion multiplayer seems to have been limited to invading cooperative games. I didn't really try to engage with it because I'm not one to invade for the sake of invading. There may well be a covenant style area out there, again this is generally not something I do in these games. The issue is that I wasn't being invaded, or when I was it was exclusively by NPC invaders. It's pretty similar to playing Dark Souls 1 today, except Elden Ring came out last month. Now, yes, I'm aware of the taunter's tongue. It just seems unusual to say that invasions are opt-in. If I'm being given the option, the answer is, of course, no. Despite the fact that I do want it to happen. It's not an invasion of my game world if I go and invite people to do it, now is it? While they have apparently taken a step away from invasion gameplay in Elden Ring, that doesn't mean that step has been towards good cooperative play. It seems better, but still not what people wanting actual co-op modes are looking for. People want to be too tarnished in the same world, not constantly figuring out which area bosses to avoid to end their co-op session. I've been waiting a long time for the chosen co-op FromSoft game to get friends into, and it looks like this wait is going to continue. 
I think these are solvable issues. FromSoft could easily make part of a DLC focus on better invasion and co-op mechanics. For instance, I don't see why we still need the rule that you can't summon people after beating an area boss, especially given how many optional bosses this game has. I would also probably just stick post-it notes to the summoning pool statues suggesting common levels for the bosses or maybe telling us what the average level of people currently in the area is so that players know which encounters they should be putting their signs down for and which ones are going to be a waste of time. Which leads into my final issue with the game, which are the bosses themselves. This is an area where open world design has created a lot of issues. Basically, my common complaint was that I was too low level, or too high level, for most encounters in the game. In fact, I was flat out told that if I couldn't stomp bosses in my first encounter to just keep exploring and try again later to see if I could stomp them in one attempt again. So, to make a comparison, after you get the Lord Vessel in Dark Souls, there's four main areas you're encouraged to go to. The Duke's Archives, Lost Isolith, New Londo, and the Catacombs. Now, the thing is that your difficulty with these areas at the level you would be following Anal Rodeo is going to depend on your build. If you're having issues in one area, you're given the option to do the others first and return to it when you're a higher level. Which is, ostensibly, the same thing that Elden Ring is trying to do. If you're getting filtered by Margit, then maybe you should go explore more of Limgrave and try to progress your character. I don't have an issue with that. In fact, the demigods being difficult is a great opportunity to encourage players to explore more of the map. For instance, each smaller area boss could give the player something to make the demigod easier. For example, if Renala does a lot of magic damage, then maybe bosses in the area drop equipment that provides magic negation. The issue I have is just explaining away bad boss mechanics that will be remembered in future as such, under the pretense that you could just overlevel the boss and stomp them with the Golden Halberd or Moonveil, or whatever weapon becomes popular after the next rebalance. So, my example is Leonin Misbegotten. He's the area boss for Castle Morn. I had a lot of difficulty with this fight, and I don't like it. His aggression seems to be random. Sometimes he'll be reasonable, and sometimes he'll just attack for a minute straight right out the gate. He has multiple attacks that use similar looking animations. He can quit out of combos randomly. He has amazing mid-air control, allowing him to turn his jump momentum towards you. And he has attacks that close the gap on you from anywhere on Earth. He is a boss built around the dodge mechanic, or in other words, a Bloodborne boss. However, his arena is full of stuff to roll into. That's a problem specific to the early game. I actually noticed that pretty much every later boss has nice, flat, open arenas, or might have some pillars in them as cover for players from ranged attacks. But in the early game, they litter the arenas with stuff to trip over and then end up having a confusing tussle as the camera gets confused and you stop being able to really see what's happening. My mistake clearly was still being under the assumption at the time that normal weapons are something I should use, instead of giant weapons that cause staggers. However, when I was complaining about Leonin being a bad boss, at least from my initial observations, I was told by someone else that they didn't even really remember him because they killed him in three or four hits, and that I should just do the same. I call this idea numerical cowardice. Not as an insult to the people doing it, because it seems inevitable in Elden Ring? Here's a story. Back when I first played Dark Souls, I had a lot of skill issues with the Bell Gargoyles. I was just bad at the game. And that's about as far as you can get without trying to become better. However, being an entitled player, I decided that the issue wasn't me or my abilities, but the game was just badly made. Clearly, the designers didn't know what they were doing given a boss this early that much health. Yes, the problem was numerical, not skill. And so I decided to solve the problem numerically. I tried to do this by grinding the guys that get killed by the dragon over and over and leveling that way. It didn't work. Because the bell gargoyles can't be brute forced. Well, I don't know, maybe they can. Maybe if I had climbed that ladder 5,000 more times and reached a high enough level, I could have eventually brute forced my way past my skill issues as a player. Now, numerical cowardice shouldn't be confused with leveling. That's not what I'm suggesting. It is fair to say the designers know that at some point between the Undead Asylum and Bell Gargoyles, the player's gonna level up. It's much more pronounced with later bosses like Ornstein and Smaug, but generally speaking, the designers can work under an assumption of how much a player will level based on the resources they have been provided and enemies they have fought up until that point. It's easier to predict in a Souls game because they're more linear. But in Elden Ring, it's more difficult. It seems to be largely left up to the community now what the correct level for each boss is, which is what causes issues with that uncertainty issue. There are definitely bosses that I stomped easily that probably created a lot of issues for someone watching. 
But when the standard approach to bosses is supposed to be to just go level elsewhere until they become jokes, well, that is cowardly. And I didn't do it, at least not until the final boss. It's also a difficult problem to design around, one I don't envy. This is a consequence of the game being open world, something I'm certain the people at FromSoft are capable of tackling in the future. But pretending it doesn't exist is not doing them any favors. The response to me saying that Godric doesn't need multiple area of effect attacks should not be telling me to just spam jumping heavy attacks with the Golden Halberd. Allow me to flip that script on you. Magma Worm is a good boss. I barely even remember it because I stomped it at a higher level. You shouldn't complain about how the boss fight is the equivalent of touching the side of a spike because it's an optional encounter. See how that feels? Magma Worm is objectively a terrible boss. You shouldn't excuse its issues the way I just did. Well, that's how I feel about many of the bosses people are excusing in the same way. There are certainly skill issues I had to overcome in Elden Ring. As an example, more emphasis is placed in this game on incorporating blocks into your defensive strategy. Radigan, the game's final boss, became much easier once I figured out which attacks to dodge and which attacks to block. I'm so used to their games leaning on dodge as a crutch that I didn't expect blocks to even be worth doing. Another instance is Radon. I actually love this fight. It might be my favorite in the entire game, despite how many people have complained about it. At a surface level, it seems like just another horse combat encounter, but Radon absolutely destroys Torrent. I realized, however, that the game is trying to make you use Torrent strategically, and that you're meant to actually fight Radon on the ground while using Torrent to maneuver around and summon your allies. That's great, and I really enjoyed learning what I was initially doing wrong and eventually overcoming this boss, something that the game director Miyazaki said was a goal of the game. I didn't beat Radon by having bigger numbers, I beat Radon by becoming better. This fight was awesome, and my opinion of the game got better after this point. Probably just because I was overpowering areas with cheese, but it seemed to me like after Radon, the boss fights stopped having many of the issues I described with aggressiveness, confusing movesets, or cluttered arenas. At least mostly anyways, there are still a few bad boss fights in the latter part of the game. The problem is that Torrent seems to be in a bad place right now. Most of the open world bosses that involved Torrent were jokes because I had him, and in a future playthrough I plan on using Torrent as little as possible in fights. Like all new mechanics in Elden Ring, I'm sure this is something they will iron out in the future. FromSoft has historically implemented new mechanics badly, only to work them out in later games, and I see no evidence of that trend changing. One thing that stood out to me was that Torrent didn't really seem to have upgrades. I don't know if he levels alongside you because you can't see his health directly, only when he's hurt. That said, if I found an upgrade for Torrent in a chest, I would be much more excited than if I found another generic crafting material. So it's only natural that they should add upgrades for the horses. I mean, you could add in a system today for it with spirit tuning. Lord knows I had the spare resources to do it. I want to talk about the game's final boss. Radigan is great. He was kind of a pushover because I was using extremely overpowered gear, but I can easily see this being a satisfying final boss in the future playthrough. Then I got to the real final boss, the Elden Beast. Oh my god, Taluchan. It was Attack on Titan all along. It's a fucking Attack on Titan reference. It's literally Haluchan. Yeah, thanks for reminding me that I have to make that video soon. Unsurprising since Godfrey seems to be a reference to Senator Armstrong. Played college ball, you know. I'm joking about you being Armstrong, by the way. But... Could have gone pro if I hadn't joined the Navy. Actually, Radigan seems to be a mix of Aaron and Ymir visually. I'm sure there's tons of stuff like this you can probably pick out given enough time. The ending was great until this point. If Radigan had just had a difficult second phase, nobody would have had an issue. Here's the problem. Each attempt involves a walk up to this light before it blinds and deafens you, then there's a cutscene you have to skip, then you have to fight Rat again. Once you beat him, there's another cutscene, and then you have to fight the Elden Beast. So every time you want to take a stab at this terrible boss, you have to beat another better boss and skip two cutscenes first. Moreover, the Elden Beast is just a generic giant monster that's too big to fit on your screen. I actually think he's a clone of another boss, Astel, natural born of the void. 
They have very similar movesets, including teleporting around the arena and summoning giant volleys of attacks. I'm sure there's a deep lore cut out there about their similarity, but the thing is that I and a lot of people hated Astell as a boss, but could forgive it because it's technically optional, and also it takes far less time to restart that fight. Like, it seems fitting as part of Rani's quest to fight this boss, but it is not fitting as a conclusive boss to the entire game. The Elden Beast is not optional and requires you to beat another better boss to get to it, which means it's just bad contrast for the game. And again, it's an Attack on Titan reference to a creature that is universally associated with the series' bad ending. God, I hope the anime is wrapped up before this video gets published. But yeah, let's just say I wasn't enthused at the final boss. I didn't even feel catharsis at getting to beat up the manifestation of Hajime Isayama's spite. When I beat Radigan, it felt like I had mildly earned it as mildly as a scumbag using Moonveil and Mimic Tear can feel. When I beat the Elden Beast, it felt like I just got lucky. There's usually one or two bosses in a FromSoft game playthrough that will make you feel like you got lucky when you defeated them. It's usually not the same bosses per playthrough, so generally it dissipates with repeat runs. However, for most of the game, it felt like a majority of the bosses I beat, that I didn't stomp on the first attempt anyways, came down to just luck. I got lucky and the boss was less aggressive. I got lucky and the boss didn't use their area of effect attacks. I got lucky and the boss didn't use their instant kill grab attack. It really wasn't until I fought Renala that I felt that I had actually beaten a boss rather than having beaten the random number generator determining the order of attacks. And even then, I'm not sure if she's actually difficult yet, that's something to be gauged with time, but it felt refreshing to have a boss that felt like it was designed to challenge me rather than designed to just kill me, because there is a very distinct difference. That's the thing, this video is difficult because the game is so new. People are treating it now like people treated Dark Souls 3 at this same point after its launch. It wasn't until a month or two had passed that people started being able to actually articulate that game's problems. Turns out it was not, in fact, the greatest game ever made. Sure to replace Dark Souls in terms of legacy. Which are things that were claimed when it came out, yet now people look back at that game much differently. I don't think that Elden Ring is going to fall off as dramatically, or maybe even at all. And if you told me that as far as 2022 goes, we've already gotten our game of the year, I'd handily believe you. However, to pretend that the game is a masterpiece is to ignore the Godskin duo. And I never again want to bring up Dark Souls 3 in a conversation only to have someone immediately mention the three bonfires in a row at Lothric Castle. Elden Ring does that constantly. So yes, I do still recommend Elden Ring. It's a fun game that held me in a way that Bloodborne and Sekiro didn't. It's just unfortunate that the game has been surrounded by an annoying discourse. The fact is that I have been treated differently for doing nothing different than usual. When Cyberpunk 2077 came out, I cut through both the hype and the hysteria to give my honest thoughts on the game, thoughts that seem to have mostly held up. I did the same thing here. I did not allow myself to be consumed with hype, and I didn't allow myself to believe hysteria about the game. I was simply evaluating it for what it was, and some people who believe themselves above the concept of becoming a fanboy were not pleased that their parasocial daddy wasn't buying the hype. It's been an embarrassing display for many, and I hope that Elden Ring serves as the roots of a new consumer movement to eventually shake up both the game's journalism industry as well as a new industry of vultures on YouTube who thrive on making compilations of games failing, who were upset that Elden Ring didn't fail harder. Maybe it can even be a day of reckoning for AAA game devs, who've long turned into an insular community preaching to each other about what gamers want at conferences instead of actually listening to their player base's feedback. As for me personally, I predict I'll be playing this game again real soon. I've wanted to take a stab at a more casual Let's Play or stream, just as experience, and this game seems perfect for that. I don't even have to strain my brain to imagine myself giving this the long-form treatment in the future but I'm not making promises. There is a lot I didn't get to say, like that half of the game's illusory walls are in a single dungeon. Now I do have to apologize, primarily to my patrons. Note again that I am writing and including this before the backlash from the fake video, if there is any. The patrons were kept in the dark on the fake video bit, as was literally everyone, but the patrons who supported me obviously deserved to know. It was just that I felt it was impossible to achieve my goals with the fake video if there was a small group who knew it was fake at the time. Answering the question why is still something I'll have to do at another time, but I can say now that I generally don't intend on this being something I do again, mostly because it's a trick that will only work once, 
I do appreciate my patrons, and the goal with the fake video was spiteful, but not towards them. As a public status update, I am a great deal of the way through writing the Skyrim script, and we'll have a public announcement once that draft is finalized. Patrons will continue to get more specific and detailed updates, albeit the updates tend to be more detailed once I'm editing the video. If you want to be in on that, if you want to see my other videos early, or if you want to have your names in the credits of my real videos, then that's the way to go do it.